Okay, so what we're going to be doing for several lectures this uh, fall is looking at <laughs> getting started in genealogy. And in doing that, um, we have several objectives. One, just generally introduce genealogical research principles with a focus on events. And events is a technical term in genealogy research. So we'll talk about what events are. Discussion of research techniques. And today we'll just touch on it, but we're gonna talk about names and places a little bit because names and places are the core of how you do your research. Websites that can give you information, how to organize your data. And I should comment, we're mostly focused on US research in this sequence, although we will hit immigration and we will talk briefly about European research. And we're gonna not spend time on DNA, uh, but we will get to DNA eventually. So one of my favorite cartoons of genealogy research. No matter what you do, you're gonna find a couple of people in your family that are interesting. <laughs> okay, so today we'll get started and organized. We'll talk about what events are. We're gonna talk about how to work with the internet and get the introduction of geography and names. In August, I do an annual review of what's happening on the internet and we'll do the same thing, but with a focus on making sure that uh, new researchers get a very good look at what's going on. September, we'll look at geographic places. Place is how the data is organized. October, we'll deal with names. November, with immigration and a little research outside the US. And in February, a little research based on DNA. Beginning in August, we'll set aside some time at the end of each meeting <clears throat> for you to share your research discoveries and questions. And I should comment, if in the interim between meetings you have serious questions, feel perfectly free to email them to the Oakmont Ancestry at gmail.com, which is our general uh, address. And I will try and respond both promptly and uh, uh, parsimoniously. So genealogy is a study of important people in our lives and our family's history. Um, it is to me, direct ancestors, but it's also, and this is another semi-technical term, the fan club. The total family, associates, neighbors, these all turn out to be important. Uh, we can talk a little bit later about why. And historical context. For those of you who are on earlier, uh, Chris was talking about uh, discovering that her, uh, one of her ancestors as a widow operated an ordinary and how that brought in, brings a historical context to uh, what, what you're looking at for the lives of the family. We use events and build a story of each individual. Now, the next is me personally, but I just advocated one person at a time. My brain simply cannot remember which sister was Margaret or Martha, unless I'm building on a set of facts that I'm looking at at the same time. So I may look at a 1900 census and say, okay, there's a child there who's named Margaret and she's 18. And by the 1910 census, she's disappeared. If I'm looking at the 1910 census, I don't remember whether it's Margaret or Martha, unless I'm really looking at that person and putting it together. So what are events? Clearly there are personal events. The number one is your vital statistics, birth, marriage, death. Um, in the time prior to 1900, divorce was rare. It's become more common, uh, but you had death that was more common so that you had widows and widowers who would remarry. Uh, your parents, your siblings, your children are all part of your personal events in life. They may not have an exact date on them, but they have an associated piece in your event space. Your religion, your education, your occupation, your residence. Um, I was able to trace my um, uh, wife's mother, grandmother, who was Polish, right after she came into this country, 
because she had the same occupation in two consecutive censuses. And although the name was close, being Polish, the name was not spelled the same way. Migration, citizenship, big deal. Then there are governmental events. There are the censuses. Every 10 years, the census. There are tax payments, which often show up in records. There are voting records. You can get the voting records, including the party involved, for Californians going way back and coming fairly recently even. Then there are judicial records, deeds, wills, court events of various kinds. Military. Uh, people had to register for the military. People served in the military. People got pensions. Um, women do not show up as frequently in that category. Um, although by World War II, there were a lot of women who were in the military. Um, but they do show up earlier uh, as uh, widows getting pensions. When you look at an event, you want to look at everybody. There are a number of people in every event. So you have the principles. So in your marriage, you think of the bride and the groom. You have witnesses. Okay, in a marriage uh, license, there are often people who act as witnesses. And in marriage itself, you have a best man and a maid of honor. And you have officials, like a minister. Even those who are not principals may provide important clues for more information. Um, at one point, I was trying to break apart three different McKinney families um, in Campbell County, Virginia, near Lynchburg during the uh, 1700s. And what I was able to do was discover that when they got married, one group had Minister A and one group had Minister B and one group had Minister C. And then based on that, I separated them into three families. And then I could later confirm through other research that I was accurate. So all these people are important. Even if your ancestor was not a principal, the fact they're in the record is still important. So um, one of my favorites is uh, in the marriage of my great grandparents, Amanda Vaughn and William David Christian, um, <clears throat> the person who stands up for him is uh, Richard Rice, Robert Rice. Actually, it's R. Rice in, on, on the document. And I figure, you know, hey, he's just a neighbor or something. No, he's his uncle. His mother's died, his father's died. He was being raised by his uncle. This was the person who was raising him. Okay, um, to find information and record it, you gotta start someplace. And most of us start with family search. And by the way, all of the things in here will be online on our website, okay, which is oakmontgenclub.org. Okay, uh, so you can go there, you can find this project, uh, presentation. You can also find the um, recording of this when I get it done. And you also can find a section that says, here are links to all of the places you ought to know about. So you'd have a link to Family Search. Family Search is a free website with vast amounts of information, most of which is in original records. And if you like genealogy, you will love original records. You will need to create a username and a password, but it's free. And it's not a bad place to start your family tree. Speaking of which, um, so that's one thing you can do, online family tree. If you like family uh, hard copies of things, go to our website where you can print out a family group record. This is a family group record. Husband, wife, children, spouses, key dates, one piece of paper per family. And if, if by the way, if, if, uh, if the husband or wife has two spouses, you get a different sheet of paper for each one. And then of course you have a traditional ancestral chart. And you can go there, you can find these, you can print them out, you can fill them out if you happen to like hard copy of stuff. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of research now. We're gonna take a look at William David Christian. Okay, so let me go to 
Um, come on. So you can see I have lots and lots of bookmarks. Do a lot of research. We're going to go to Family Search. Okay, and you can see that I need to sign in. There, and sign me in. Um, so we're going to look at William David Christian. Ah. Who died in 1919. And he was in Kentucky. All right, now you see the little boxes next to the research. If I click on that, it makes it exact. And exact means exact. It will not find William Christian, it will only find William David Christian. Okay. Uh, uh, so here, if you say exact, it will be Kentucky, but it will not find. Um, a, a record that says um, Louisville, Kentucky, because that doesn't say Kentucky. So you don't use that a lot here. So let's go down and we're going to search. So there's William David Christian, died 1919. Okay, this in fact uh, is in fact my great grandfather. So let me view the image. Okay, so classic certificate of death. This is the original, <laughs> okay? Bell County, Kentucky, died in Pineville, married. Married means his, he's not widowed. That means his wife's still living. Date of death, what did he die of? Bright's disease. That's a term that's not used anymore, but it's basically a kidney disease. Date of birth. Okay, he worked in coal mining. Here are his parents. Okay, and here's the person who reported the information. That's Harvey. Later on, we will find out, we could find out, Harvey is one of his sons. Okay, and he was buried in Grays, Kentucky. Okay, a lot of information there. Okay, and so we're writing this down, keeping track of it. Uh, on some record that we're trying to do. Now let's go back. Okay, the second record is find a grave. Find a grave is one of the several sites that track cemeteries. And so this uh, is his record at that, uh, okay. Now we have our first, you gotta be kidding. They misspelled Christian. How can you misspell Christian? Okay, but they did. So what that meant was if I had put exact down, I wouldn't have found this record. So that's the cemetery he was buried in. It's in Morrill County, which I, I understand these areas because I've studied them a fair amount. Okay, now I can go here. And as you, as you do research, you become familiar with different things you can do on each website. You can go to that cemetery and say, is anybody else buried there with the same name? Which by the way, I know will be Christine. Or you could go to the overall community of Lily, or you could go to the county. So we'll go to McCark Cemetery. And what we have here is in fact, four different people. We have George Calvin Christian, Christine, 1894 to 1911. John, 1902 to 1963. William David and William Henderson, 1897 to 1911. Okay, well, does it seem like these are probably his children? Good chance they are. Don't know that for sure yet. Okay, I want to point out something here because I'll talk about it in a minute. George Calvin Christian died on August 10th, 1911. William Henderson Christian died August 10th, 1911. That is not random. Okay, um, matter of fact, I'll talk about it now. <clears throat> I always knew about this because they were digging a well in the backyard. Um, uh, Calvin was down in the well doing the digging. He hit a gas line, a, a pocket of gas, passed out. Henderson jumped in after him to save him and Henderson died and they had to 
keep everybody else in the family from going in. So the two died together. Always one of the great sadnesses in my great grandmother Amanda's life. Okay, so we're getting some information here. I wanna go back now. So I'm just hitting the back button. Okay, there were 6,000 records that seemed to be associated with these set of, of information. If you click on collections, it'll tell you about all of the different databases and how many records there were. So it has death records, marriage records. What I want to go to is the US Census, okay? And um, I would comment looking quickly down here, I don't see what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna go back and put in Calvin, okay? George Calvin Christian. Okay, and we know that he was born around 1894. By the way, we don't know for sure where he was born. Okay, and by the way, we're looking for births. I will give it a, a little bit of a frame on each side because some of the databases are not uh, able to give you an exact date. And we're looking for a father who's William David. All right, now let's see what we find. So looking at all the Georges there, we don't see what we're looking for. Okay, and since I know what the answer is, I'm gonna go on down to the bottom and go to the next page. Come on. Should be showing up, George. One more and then I don't get it here, I'll have to cheat. I'm gonna cheat. I think I wrote the wrong birthday down. All right, well, we're not finding it right off the bat, so I apologize for that. But what you will find eventually, if you look at this, is he's, he's in there, researched, uh, indexed as Calvin. Take out the father and see if that helps. Oh, come on. Always helps if you're a good typist. Okay, well, I'm not gonna do that. Let me just take a quick look at one of these records because I, what I really wanna do is to show you what a census looks like. So we're gonna look at the census. So this is a typical census. This happens to be the 1910 census, okay? If you go across, you start at the top, it tells you where you are. You're in Tennessee, Hawkins County, what the civil district is you're in. Over here, it tells you what day it was taken. All of the censuses were taken as of a particular day, but the actual day on which the census taker came by might've been a different day. So he would ask the question on the day of the census, what was true? not what was true on the day he came by. Then you have enumeration districts and sheets, and you have numbers of households, you have name of people, their relationships. For women, you have a very interesting thing. In the 1910 and 1900 censuses, they asked the question, for a woman of appropriate age, how long have you been married? How many children have you had? How many are still living? So up here you have a widow, Sarah, who had 12 children, 10 are still living. 
She's 48. I'm sure you ladies would understand the idea that that's a, that was a different life. You have where the person was born, where their father was born, their mother was born, their native tongue, what they did as work or do as work, and some facts about their property. Typically, the O means they're the owner of the property, the R means they're a renter, et cetera. You can spend a lot of time here. You've got education. Um, you have for people who have, are immigrants. When did they immigrate? Lots of facts. I live in the censuses when I do research. Okay, I want to go back down to the talk. So one of the things when you get information that's interesting, think about where did you get it? You found it on the web. Where did you find it? What kind of original document was it taken from? What place was it taken? So for example, in the census, I would want to record the location, Hawkins County, Tennessee, and I probably want to record the particular district, the page number, and the line number or household number. Um, so you have to be careful that you're not picking up data that's wrong. Four major questions every time you look at a new document. Is this really the right person? William David Christian was a dilemma for me from the very first days because there were two of them or in the same year, a mile apart, one ending in Tennessee and one in Virginia, because where they were born was right on the border. Is it an original or a derivative record? An original record might be a handwritten original, okay? It might be a transcription. What's the problem with the transcription? One more person, who didn't necessarily know the spelling or couldn't read the handwriting. Is it firsthand or secondary? Think about the difference between a birth record and a death record. Birth record, dad or mom goes down to the local courthouse, fills out a record, every fact on there they know intimately. They may lie, but they know it. Think about a death record, okay? Uh, Harvey, William David Christian's son filled out the record, including who his mother and father were. Was Harvey around when he was born? No. Harvey knows what he was told or what he thinks he was told or what he thinks is true. So you can see that, that there's a big difference between primary and secondary information. Is it direct or indirect evidence? And the classic example is I'm following a family in the census and all of a sudden, at the next census, the woman is a widow. Logical conclusion, her husband died. Well, actually, in one of my grandson's families, <laughs> what we found was in fact that her husband didn't die. He ran off and was living with a young Irish woman in San Francisco, okay? But she recorded it as she was a widow. That was much, much more reasonable for where she lived. Also, the document may be great, but still contain wrong information. Forgive all of my family stories, but I have to regale you with this one. My dear Aunt Ruby married late in her life. When she married, she had been born in 1910, and the man she married was born in 1911. And she did not think it appropriate to be older than he was. So she told him she was born in 1912. He died before she did. When she died, she swore her sisters to guarantee that her tombstone would read 1912. So for all eternity, she would be younger than her husband. So what could be more accurate than the tombstone and the date of birth, right? Well, <laughs> there you got it. Um, you're going, particularly if you are dealing with um, uh, uh, European names, uh, all of the things about the way names change when they come to this country, um, always record information exactly as it appears. If there are errors, make notations about them, okay? Um, I was working on a family yesterday where one of the children was Oliver, 
Okay, got it. Next census, that child is listed as Olivia, female. Okay, turns out it is Oliver. Okay, I don't know how it got to be Olivia, but I will record that as Olivia because it's perfectly possible that the first record was wrong. Uh, and with last name spellings, it's quite often the case that the misspelling is used again and again. So why do you record it the way it is? First of all, it's easier to find it again. I can find, uh, theoretically, I could find Calvin, not Calvin. Uh, or other information may be recorded the same way. And then again, it might be right. So when you have an important fact, like a birth date, try to have two different sources. Um, if there's conflicting information, then you need to do an analysis. And if you do uh, genealogical research, the analysis is often the fun. Dig deeper, additional uh, sources. You're looking for the predominance of information to support what you've got. And when you reach a conclusion, write down your logic so you remember it. Because two years from now, when somebody says, how did you understand um, where uh, Isidore, when Isidore was born, you better, it would be nice if you had the information as to why. Um, try to keep some kind of research log. You, you don't want to keep going back to the same research sites. Um, so try to keep a record of each event, uh, the source and location. If you don't want to put things on the computer, many of us for years use three ring binders with dividers for each of the key children or key members of the family. Okay, so Family Search will let you build your own family tree. And <clears throat> you want to start with yourself, parents, grandparents. Siblings, their spouses are very important. Locations and dates are very important. Okay, if you're beginning family genealogy for the first time, talk to other living members of your family who may have information you don't know. By the way, that includes talking to yourself, making sure you write down what you do know. Um, uh, a common fact is that sometimes uh, as, a as a couple gets older, they are cared for by their youngest child. And then when they pass, their records are kept by the youngest child, who when that person passes, they're kept by one of their children. So uh, a common misconception is if you want to have the best facts, talk to the oldest members of the, fam the, uh, uh, oldest members of the family uh, you want to talk to anybody from an earlier generation than you, but be sure to check and see who has information that you may not have. Um, and that one of the reasons it includes you is remember that you may be the oldest member of your family, as I now am. Um, and take your photograph seriously. Uh, many of us have the shoebox filled with photos are the many albums with photos. Uh, ask anybody who might help, who's in that photo that you don't remember. And the only thing to keep talking to, saying to yourself is if you don't get it right, there's no way your children are gonna get it right later. Okay, many valuable websites are free. We have a list on oakmontgentclub.org. Learn to bookmark useful sites. And Google actually is a valuable resource. So I'm gonna do a, a quick search. On Google. So, um, we're gonna to go to Google and I'm going to search so why am I doing this? Well, it turns out that if you have uh, a Revolutionary War person in your family, you will probably be able to find out the day that they were inducted and the day they left the service. This is my 
fourth great-grandfather, Joseph McKinney, who served for the 5th Virginia Infantry Regiment. And by searching on the 5th Regiment, I can find there's actually a Wikipedia article. And I can go down somewhere on here, or one of the ones they have the, uh, this is the, the, the Civil War. I don't want Civil War, I want Revolutionary War. 5th Virginia Revolutionary War. Okay. Okay, so um, brief history. That's still, I want to go back one more. There we go. No, there's still the camp. Oh, here we go. Uh, here are the engagements they serviced in. If you click on them, you'll find that the dates my uh, ancestors served, they were at the Battle of Trenton and the Battle of Princeton. So you know the old picture that we all have of Washington crossing the Delaware? My ancestor was there, probably with minimal things to keep his feet warm, probably slogging in the snow, but he was there. And that makes that a really neat time for me. So don't forget that Google can add a lot of information to your research. Okay. 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 Um, if you get really serious, Ancestry is the next place to go, but it costs money. Um, however, if you think you are getting serious, you can go to any library branch with your laptop and they will let you sign in to Ancestry. More importantly, right now, because of the COVID restrictions, they have been allowed to temporar temporarily make it available at home using your library card. So if you go to the uh, uh, Sonoma County Library website, uh, they will, and, and diligently work your way through, uh, it will show you how to do that. Uh, a lot of us, however, have given up and just have a subscription. Okay, now we're gonna go to places briefly. We're doing fine on time. The thing about place is that's how records are maintained. Okay. Uh, county in the United States, county records, parishes if you're down in Louisiana. Uh, church or, or uh, religious parish records. The problem is locations change. New counties, even states are created. My favorite example is uh, Henry Dillon in my ancestry was born and died on the same farm. This was around in the middle of the 1800s. In his lifetime, he lived in seven counties in two states because he was in part of that part of Virginia that became West Virginia. And they gradually were cutting out new counties while he was living. So those records, are actually in seven different places. They, when they put together a new county, they don't go back and glom up all the records that relate to that county. They stay in the old place. Today's boundaries are not the historic boundaries. Okay, so um, if you go to this website, and there are a couple of others, and they're on our, on our website where we do the links, you can go to them. What they do is they actually See if we can actually do that. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to take a state, um, state California, just for the fun of it. Okay. View an interactive map. Okay. How to get Nevada? I want to somewhere in California. I guess I clicked on the wrong one. There we go. Interactive map. So what they're doing here is this is what California looked like from 1850 to 51, okay? And then if I click on the next one, we have some new counties. Then keep clicking. See new counties beginning to inform as, the, as it takes shape. So it turns out if 
your ancestor was born in Lake County or an event occurred in their life in Lake County. Well, for a lot of the early uh, period of the state, Lake County didn't exist. It was part of Napa and part of Mendocino. So the records for the early Lake County people are gonna be there, not in Lake County. Okay, um, I will also point out that although it's rare, um, spellings and names do change. So if you've got a place you're pretty familiar with, or maybe one you're not, maybe you see a reference to your ancestor being uh, uh, in, a, in a location you don't recognize, Google it and you probably will find where it was. Okay, and then I find it fun just to read a little bit about the county. If you've got a place where your family hung out for a bunch of years um, or the city or the whatever. I mean, if you, if you were a, uh, uh, Norwegian or Swedish immigrant, uh, you ended up sometimes in these weird places between Iowa and Minnesota. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's sort of fun to look at them because everybody who was there was Norwegian or whatever. Okay, names, real quick introduction to names. Remember that whatever your name is, it can be in different ways. If you're searching on Google, Using quotes means you look for exactly that name. If I look for Samuel McKinney, I may find Samuel Jones who lives in McKinney, Texas. But if I have it in quotes, I look for Samuel McKinney, that's what I'm gonna find. But there are records that are reversed. So if you had a list of everybody who served in a particular military unit, the last name is probably first. Often, the uh, initials or the middle initial. The other thing you will find, and I'm just gonna introduce this idea, is there are certain websites that let you use wildcards. One kind of wildcard is a single character, usually a question mark. So if I put a question mark in Veronica, I get both spellings, the C and the K. If I put a question mark at the beginning of ARL, I will get Carl, both spellings, I'll also get Earl. So that's what it is. <clears throat> a, a asterisk usually means any number of characters, including zero. So Sam with an asterisk gets Sam, Samuel, and Samantha in research. So as we go further into names, recognize that there are a problem. If you have a name or in your family that is difficult to spell, it, it wasn't that easy to spell earlier. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> for some immigrants where literacy in the English language didn't exist, they may have been literate in their own language, they didn't necessarily know how to spell their name. So there are ethnic peculiarities. <clears throat> the, the one I'm familiar with in Polish is uh, Marie's gra uh, grandmother was Bardzakowska for her last name. Her brother was Bardzakowski with an I. That's just the male female. That's just the way it is. Same last name. Uh, if you were searching for him and you searched Bardzakowska, you wouldn't find him. Um, and be aware of the idea of anglicization. Use iterative searching. If you find uh, somehow that there are two very clear uh, spellings, go back and look at uh, other records like censuses using the alternative spellings. Um, if you have a common name, uh, one of the things you can do is, is neighbor searches. We talked about the fan club. So you can search it. If, if I find you in the 1910 census and uh, your neighbor is Mr. Simons. I can go look in the 1920 census for where Mr. Simons is and see if you're around. That works. <clears throat> you can do searches by location. And you can do for searches for the full family. What I had hoped to show you with the census record on Calvin was <clears throat> we eventually found a record. There's a record there which has Calvin and Henderson and John all in the same family show up. So you know you sort of have the same family. 
There are a couple of the name search situations we'll talk about later. In a minute, we'll talk about married women. <clears throat> Names with modifiers look McKinney. Uh, people don't always uh, transcribe those the same. Um, and names that mean something in normal English are a disaster. Um, and there are some specialized given names. We'll talk about all of that later this fall. <clears throat> so spelling problems, you get alternate spelling like Kenny with an E or an I, phonetic Robert or Rupert truncated, <laughs> my wife's family, Bardzikowski became Bardzik, became Bard. Um, first names, alternates, they're obvious. Um, and male, male, female versions and phonetic. And if you're looking at early American records, J-N-O is the common way things will show up for the name John. Anglicization. You can decide to do it yourself or someone can do it to you. You may want your name to be more American. So uh, my name, uh, I have Germans in my background. They came into this country as Mooney and ended up with their name being Monty. My wife's French Canadian name was Menard, which became Maynard. <clears throat> you may want a name that's just easier to pronounce. That's the bard change. Uh, and some may be automatic. Uh, my name in Spanish is Jorge and in English is George. It's, it is the same thing. Uh, in Polish, Boleslaw turns out to be the same name as William. In German, Metzger turns out to be the same as a butcher. A Metzger is a butcher. The employee may be standardizing. Schmidt may be Smith. And you have to, if, if you're coming out of, <laughs> you're coming out of the uh, uh, Nordic countries, uh, you may have Sunderland. And that, that's become, in this country, Southern. Now we get to women. Women have many last names, and they use them at unexpected times. Expect that. So they may use their maiden name, even if married or divorced. If they have been married more than once, they may use their first marriage name. <coughs> they may indicate they are married and use their living with, their, the name of the person they're living with even if they're technically not married. I mean, after all, are you gonna tell the mailman who's doing the census that you aren't married? Um, and the name they use if they remarry could be almost any name. Maiden name, latest marriage name, first marriage name. Children's names are usually more reliable. In other words, if I had a child, by, if a woman had a child by her first husband, he, the, their, their name will be likely hit, uh, taken from him. But in something like a census, they often appear with their stepfather's name or their mother's maiden name. Collateral searching is, think about siblings. And siblings are really important. Why? First of all, you can get better records. Uh, I found the confirmation of the village in Poland that my wife's grandmother was from by looking at her grandmother's brother's record where he uh, had to sign up for the draft uh, in 1918, 1917, okay? So he had that, she didn't have to sign up, he did. Um, logically, they likely born in the same place. They probably lived in the same place when children. They probably moved together. They're probably listed in the same will or deed, probably attended the same church, and often obituaries give information on siblings. And that's one of the reasons as you do research, you often look for the last to die because obituaries became more and more complete over time as did death records. So the last child to die will often have the best information about the, their mother's maiden name. Okay, locally, <clears throat> Sonoma Library has a genealogy branch, it's open again. You probably need to call to find out what hours. Um, they have ancestry. Uh, they have uh, good Sonoma County material. And they also historically have had helpers. The Family History Center at the local Mormon church uh, is still closed, but when it reopens, uh, they're very helpful people. 
and the California Genealogical Society, Mensa Mensa, it's not the, the best uh, research center, but it has some good stuff if you're California, is in California. So that's what I wanted to cover. I'm going to stop sharing and open up for questions. <laughs>